Hello, everybody. This is uh, Andy Berger. I am the Vice President of uh, the Experimental Sounding Rocks Association and Launch Director for the Spaceport America Cup. Uh, excited to have Christopher Harris with us. Uh, Chris is the lead uh, for our Mission Control Center, which is basically the heartbeat of the operations of launch operations of flight. Um, not only does it handle all communications for our operations team and the flights themselves, uh, but it also handles tracking of the recovery teams uh, and a, a significant number of other operational activities uh, that we would not be able to operate uh, at the scale and scope and speed that we do uh, at the Cup uh, as an event as a whole. So it, it's a very exciting time for me to have Chris here. He's going to be talking about uh, this year's new requirement for GPS tracking. Uh, the size of the, I'm going to give you just a brief background on the why we're driving forward uh, with the uh, GPS new requirement. Uh, the size and scope of the event has gotten to a situation where we cannot have teams out in the field spending hours upon hours tracking their rockets and just trying to look for them in general. We're requiring the GPS uh, tracking solution so that teams will have a much, much higher chance of knowing exactly where the rocket is, traveling straight to that rocket, recovering it, and bringing it back. The quick survey that we did back in 2019 showed that teams that had GPS tracking devices in them uh, spent less than an hour. It was closer to 35, 40 minutes recovering the rocket, whereas teams without GPS tracking took upwards of three plus hours. We cannot have that happen in 2022. So GPS requirement is new, may be painful and challenging for teams, particularly some of the international teams. But I'm going to allow Chris here to uh, talk about the requirement in detail and talk about how the Mission Control Center uh, can assist in supporting the team uh, with some of the equipment that they have. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christopher Harris. Thank you, sir. All righty. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, so Andy just gave gave you my presentation so there you go i think we can can break now i'm just kidding don't don't go anywhere so uh let's say uh, let's go ahead and get started so obviously we're going to be talking about gps slide all right so specific to gps and what is required i want to give you a little bit of background on where the requirement came from so again the requirement i'm talking about is having a, a GPS transponder on your vehicle that we can see, which is very important. Um, as Andy mentioned, uh, without uh, additional capability to track your vehicle, uh, we're seeing extended uh, recovery times and a, a few other issues. So again, I wanna back up real quick and, and base this conversation off of why we have that requirement. And then I'm gonna get into the requirement a little bit a few details about that requirement. Um, I, I'm open to questions anytime. Please just type them in the chat um, and they'll get conveyed to me and we'll, we'll answer them in real time. So the first piece of this puzzle is what you've hear, uh, heard referred to as MCC. You may have heard that you know, on people's radios and so forth at the cup and so forth. So that's Mission Control Center, uh, which is basically a big gray trailer uh, with a bunch of antennas hanging off of it. Now in that trailer, um, is the capability to handle all of the voice and telemetry for the entire cup. Now, that may seem like a, a small task, you know, hey, someone's on a radio and they just need to talk to somebody else. Um, but if you have that situation where you have one person with a radio and they just need to talk to somebody else, and you multiply that by an event of this size, what you end up with is severe congestion. And that not only does that happen on the voice side of things, but it happens on the telemetry side of things too. And this, I'll go ahead and plug this. Um, when you're testing your GPS at your school, wherever, local field, you don't have that type of congestion that you do at the cup. So that's kind of the basis for, for this requirement. Now, uh, there's a, uh, the, on the next slide, we've got a, a couple of pictures of MCC. And it's, a, I, I like to talk about the pictures mostly because a you know, picture is worth a thousand words, right? So this first picture you're looking at, uh, you've got a couple of operators here. There's four operators in the trailer. 
Now, the human operator is a very important piece of this. So that's how traffic gets conveyed from one network to another, right? So if we have a voice network for, say, flight, and they're they're basically launching your rocket or getting the you know helping you get the the rocket uh, on the rail and so forth. Well, there's another uh, network running for recovery, right? Because you have people out in the field simultaneously. So any of those networks, voice and telemetry, are communicated through the of operators and computer network within this this MCC. So that's kind of how all those networks attach together. And you can see uh, on one of the screens in there, I hope you can see at least, there's a, uh, a screen that's got some circles on it. And some of the circles are red and some of the circles are green. Uh, those circles are very important to us and they're important to the recovery teams too. What that tells us is what the safety radius is for a given vehicle on a given rail and who's in that circle, which is very important. And that's going to lead to the GPS requirement or a piece of the GPS requirement. We know where your vehicle is at in real time. So if it's, is it on the rail? Is it in flight down ballistic in an area that has people in it? So you start to see why this requirement was put together. On the next slide, there's a, another shot of the, the uh, Mission Control Center. And it shows uh, kind of a few of the other operators. So like I said, there's four operators in this this uh, this center. And each of those operators is basically assigned to a network. And that network, like I said, is mainly a, a combination of both voice and telemetry. So for instance, on recovery, um, which I think is on the, the next slide. Yeah, so personnel GPS. So for recovery, we use personnel GPS tracking. Um, I, I'm sure any of you that have been to the cup remember the, the packs that you put on. And so why would we want to track those people? And this, again, leads into why would you want to track the vehicle? Well, we want to track those people to, to know where they're at, right? So they're, they're long out of sight. Um, without that tracking, all we would have is, is voice saying, hey, I'm by the big sand dune or I'm by the big bush or the mountains are to my right which is definitely not enough information to, to convey uh, to keep you safe. Uh, make sure you're within a radius that you can actually uh, return on foot before it gets dark and so forth. So we use that information to make judgment calls on uh, whether you need help um, and basically safety. Now, since we know your position and we know the other positions, we've noticed that the teams start to talk to each other. And we try to um, we try to use that as much as possible. Obviously, things get a little busy when you get a bunch of teams out there. Uh, but we have found that the teams create these ad hoc networks out in the field to help find each other's rockets. And people started reporting over the years. They started reporting, "Hey, there's a there's a pink parachute, you know, uh, 200 feet from my position." Well, great. We have your position. And now we set a flag there and we try to convey that information over to the recovery teams coming in to our recovery tent. Has, has anybody seen a pink parachute? Yeah, it's at these coordinates because Team X already found that for you. So you can see how that could be really, really helpful, especially if you don't have a good flight and you end up with a debris field instead of a clean recovery. Um, so that's uh, one piece of uh, the usefulness of the telemetry from, from the personnel. Now, that uh, as I mentioned, that we also have voice communications with them, which is a you know basic uh, you know radio transceiver setup, so forth. Now it's on a it's on a, a repeater, which is not really inside the scope of this discussion, unless somebody really wanted to talk about that. But um, one other piece of this puzzle is the frequencies that we operate on for the voice and tracking of the recovery systems. They are not ham frequencies, they're professional frequencies, and they're specifically placed in bands to keep some bands quiet. So you're going to see me later on really push the 440 megahertz bands for your telemetry. And the reason why we want to push those bands for your telemetry is because we're keeping them quiet. There's no large transmitters on those bands, or at least that's what we're trying to, to keep from. So any of the high power voice communications that we use that can range, you know, 30 miles, that's all done on a different band. 
So that way we're not um, basically masking or desensitizing telemetry. And that's very important, especially in a very crowded uh, situation, which we have. On the next slide, you can see some of the uh, the pictures um, of the recovery packs and, and recovery in, in action there. So as you guys know, we uh, oh, I didn't add a title. Oh, I'll have to talk to my editor about that. You can you can assume what the title is. <laughs> But uh, anyhow, um, so there's the PACs in operation. Uh, you can see the, the, some of the, uh, the students getting trained on voice communications and so forth. A uh, couple words on voice communication. We, we, train, we train them there, but in your own setting and using your own radios and then using our radios, um, communicate very clearly. And I encourage you to learn phonetics. Um, I don't know if you, you know, some of you that have been in crowded radio situations, uh, voice can be difficult to understand. So if you can learn your phonetics, alpha, beta, you know, so forth, that really helps in conveying information. And on the next slide, let's get into the, uh, to the base of this conversation, which is the, uh, the rocket GPS. So this is a, a new requirement and I, I, because of COVID and so forth, it, we haven't seen it in its, uh, you know, grand uh, uh, implementation yet. Uh, but again, the, the the requirement is we need to know where your rocket's at, and everything else is is based off of that or limited um, after that that statement, that root statement. So how can we know where your rocket's at? Obviously, we're not going to track it visually, and uh, none of us can afford a radar. So we say, okay. Put a uh, put a COTS tracker in your rocket. Very simple, right? So what that COTS tracker does is it limits uh, what we have to look for because we can't look for all frequencies and and you know and all types of transmissions infinitely, right? Let's go to the next next slide. Here's a picture, a close up of some of the screens that uh, that I talked about earlier. Now you can, if you look closely at the screen, you can see the circles that I talked about before. So those are the safety radiuses. And you can also see tracks and dots and so forth. So all of those tracks are recovery teams. And you can see the recovery teams cutting right through all of these, these safety radiuses, right? Well, we need to know and we need to convey to them, hey, you know, this, this vehicle or this set of rails is going to red flag. You need to divert this direction or you need to, to hang out for a while or so forth to, to keep you safe. Now, that's that's also true for the flight itself. So there's teams out in the field when the rockets are flying, the rockets going up, rockets coming down. And the more information we have about where the rocket's going and how fast it's falling, uh, the better we can make calls to the folks in the field and let them know what's going on. So. Go ahead, go to the, the next slide, please. All right, so I know I, I get a ton of emails about this topic. What kind of tracker can I use? The short answer is ones that work with mission control. Your next question is, okay, what works with mission control? In general, we receive APRS packets. If you don't know what APRS is, great, go look it up. It's a standard for tracking. Um, and that packet is transmitted over some standard um, uh, protocols. Yes, yes, it's transmitted over a standard protocol. And that protocol, um, again, is, is fairly simplistic. So uh, it's very good for noisy conditions and so forth. I get a lot of people saying, hey, I wanna use this protocol or I made up this protocol. Unfortunately, we can't adopt or change our system for a hundred different teams. So that's kind of why you're getting shuffled into this this COTS piece. The COTS piece also helps the the uh, the data portion of it, right? So when you get your rocket back and you go talk to uh, Mr. Merrick, which you're going to see, and he's going to put you through the ringer about your data. Um, the easier it is for him to get your flight data, the easier it is for you to get your points and, and move through the competition. Now. Most of the COTS trackers on the market are ham. Um, and then that leads to the next issue that I get with a lot of students is, oh, we don't have a ham license. Well, 
I can tell you that I know most of you are engineering students and some of you are double E's. If you live in the United States and you are an engineering student, you have probably taken a class second semester physics called E&M. If you have taken that class, you could probably walk into the test and take it without studying and pass. Yes, it's that easy. Now, there's a few rules that you need to look up for, you know, the, the whole FCC side of it. But basically, if you're an engineering student and you're in the United States, you do not have an excuse to not get a ham license. It is super easy. Please just please just go get it. <laughs> and it's 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 advantageous for you. So what that allows you to do is sit on a single frequency and you claim it. And now, obviously, we organize those frequencies for you. But throughout the cup, that's your frequency. Now, there is a possibility you may have to share, but we, we space those apart and uh, there, there wouldn't be a, an overlap of the actual flight and so forth because there's only a limited number of frequencies. Uh, but the point is, is it allows you to park and stay there. Now, with some of these other non-licensed transmitters and so forth, um, I'm sure several of you know how those work. Um, they like to hop around and, and look for a frequency that's open and so forth, and they're not allowed to interfere with other transmitters and receivers and so forth. So, and I'm sure several of the double E's are, are spouting out all the protocols that they use right now and so forth. And that's great. And it will work great standing outside, you know, on the lawn at your school. It will work great. When you bring it to the cup, the chances of it failing are very, very high. I highly recommend not using that type of transmitter. And I know you can go look up all the specs all day long, but is it really worth the risk to come all the way to the cup and not pay the $13 and go take the test for the ham license? So anyhow, and most of our receivers are that type of um, work with that type of transmitter. So it is possible if you had uh, such as, you know, the featherweight or something like that, which is is one type of non um, uh, ham. They do have ham version, but uh, one type of 900 megahertz, I believe, um, uh, transponder that we can work with. We only have a limited number of receivers on those. So it's possible you could get hung up on the rail waiting for someone else to fly. So we have a clear GPS lock on you. Whereas on the ham side, we have many, many, many receivers and the chances of you getting hung up or stomped on by somebody else transmitting are very, very low. So I highly encourage you to go with a COTS ham transponder. Question on Laura. Uh, there's a question on Laura. What is the question? The question is, is the Laura transceiver one? Uh, no, we do not support LoRa at this time. Uh, LoRa is, I understand you wanting to use LoRa, but LoRa is pretty slick. Um, the issue is on the receive side. Uh, the issue is our side, actually. So the receive side, um, you do have the possibility of, of having some crowding and so forth. Um, uh, LoRa, yeah, Laura is kind of its own little beast. Works well alone. I don't really recommend it for answering this requirement. Um, it might be um, if you're if you're doing some SRAD stuff. In addition, uh, Laura is a pretty cool protocol to play with outside of that. But again, I would go something. You know, you've you've heard you guys are building rockets. You've heard of Kiss, right? Keep it simple. You know, whatever. You know what I mean. So uh, keeping this piece of it simple and reliable and a fixed frequency on a very simple known protocol is 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 in your favor. OK, so I, I really like to drive that home. A question on Big Red Bees. One other question. So question on Big Red Bees. Big Red Bees are great. Um, which Big Red Bee are we talking about? Because Big Red Bees got a couple different flavors. So team has two. Okay, so the question is, can I use uh, Big Red B with ham frequencies? And the question is about two of them. So I'm assuming maybe you're either doubling up or you have a two-stage or you have a deployable or something like that. 
This is exactly what we're looking for. So big red bees on a 440 ham frequency, not, not 440 specifically, but that band, um, uh, using APRS uh, is, is perfect. The big red bee is a fabulous, fabulous transponder. Um, and I, I highly, highly recommend it. So yes, absolutely. And you will, if you have not interfaced with the, uh, the frequency setup portion of this early in the, the cup when we start uh, establishing frequencies and who's got what and so forth, if you haven't done that yet, then uh, you're basically golden. Uh, so this next round for, for next summer, if you have that set up, you have two big red Bs and you enter into the, the frequency form that you guys will see and you're emailing frequencies at davincimakerlabs.com, it'll be a cakewalk for you. You're, you're basically immediately golden at that point. Uh, was there another question? Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the next slide. And if, if somebody comes up with a question from, you know, a, a prior slide, prior topic, something like that, please just, just ask. Okay, don't, don't, don't be bashful. Okay, so the SRADs. So we have, there's kind of a caveat in here and I'm, it, you'll have to, we'll have to talk to some SRA folks because I don't make the rules, I just follow them. Um, but I believe there's a bit of a caveat on the, the COTS, um, uh, uh, sorry, a flight computer or transmitter. Um, and that's SRADs that comply with specific protocols and frequencies to be received by MCC. I know the year before, uh, we had some requirements, um, uh, or some uh, requests for this and we had a couple of teams meet it and I was super impressed. So I had a couple of teams say, hey, we built our own flight computer and it transmits, you know, we get GPS and it transmits APRS at 1200 baud AFSK um, on the 70 centimeter ham band. Can we use that? And yes, um, you absolutely can. Now, we need to verify uh, with the rules for the current competition and how how that works. Um, but seeing that sort of, of work and diligence in building your own SRAD system is, um, is slick. That, that is really cool. And I'm, I'm assuming I may have a few questions on this. Um, if you're still mulling over your question, no worries. Throw it in the chat. We'll come back to it. No problem. So on the next slide here, uh, we basically covered this, but we'll wrap back around to how the GPS transponders that you're using on your rockets um, work with MCC. And again, a few more comments on why. So you're out in the desert and you've got your Yagi antenna and you're pointing at your rocket and you've got a great signal and everything's cool and your rocket takes off and your signal's gone. Or your rocket takes off and after deployment, your signal's gone, which happens quite often. So our rig um, is, is actually not optimized to look at your vehicle uh, straight up. We can do that. We can totally do that for, for high altitude flights. But where our high gain is at is when you're at two or 3,000 feet and coming down all the way to the ground. So you standing on the ground pointing your Yagi antenna once that vehicle gets to 1,000 feet, 500 feet, and you're a couple of miles away, your chances of having good packets are very, very low. Whereas if you take a big high gain antenna, throw it up on a 30, 40, 50 foot mast, now you're in a totally different ballpark, right? And that's one of the things that's key to MCC. So our antenna masts, number one, it's tall. The antennas up there are very high gain, so they're very large antennas. So these recovery teams out in that's why we can hear them. And that's why we can broadcast back to them. That's why we can see their GPS packets. And that's also why we can see your rocket. So all this has happened, right? You've flown. And so, oh, we got another question coming in. Let's see, what do we got here? Uh, why did you do the... <laughs> and I this was a good time to, to bring it in. <laughs> um, yeah, APRS is completely outdated. You are totally right, but it is built into so much gear. Um, it's, it's 
historic um, and it just, frankly, it works. So some of the other ways of doing that um, are out there and they are cheaper, but APRS is exceedingly reliable. So that's uh, that's basically where we're at with the, the APRS solution. Now, will we will we add more protocols in the future? Yeah, absolutely we will. And we want to continue to grow that. Now, we can't add a protocol for one person. We can add protocols for, for groups, right? So we want to see people kind of go in a direction and make sure we're adding protocols and hardware to, to mission control that fit a group of people. Right. So kind of like the featherweight was people started coming with the featherweight. And by the way, the, the biggest thing on the featherweight was folks coming from other countries uh, that that ham license is a real issue. Those are the folks that that we really want to see, you know, using a featherweight unless they can can get their ham license and so forth. Again, I will go back to the comment about the U.S. You have no reason to not have your technician's license. Sorry, that's that's hard stop on that one. I think there was also a comment about the cost. Uh, uh, of APRS or maybe the cost of some of the hardware. Um, that's a bit of a misnomer. If you, if you look at the cost of, of, you know, transponder X compared to transponder Y, eh, it's, it's a bit of a toss up. Now, some of the, the flight computers that have APRS 70 centimeter transmitter built in and have all these different outputs for all these different shoots and, you know, and deployment charges and ignition and stuff like that. Those can creep up there and get a little pricey, but they're also very, very capable. So I'm guessing you can probably, you can probably guess which one I'm talking about, which is the, the Telemega, but um, it's, it is a, an awesome flight computer. Now, I want to add to that some of these computers, some of these COTS um, uh, units are open source. And only a few of the groups have have realized that. Um, I don't want to plug individual manufacturers, but you might want to look at some of that because some of them have some really interesting capabilities. And obviously, open source opens a whole new Pandora's box of, of engineering and experimenting, um, which is what this competition is about. Now, um, looks like my uh, my camera just timed out. But anyways, we can keep on going. Uh, so again, we covered the high gain antennas. The bands are kept quiet, which is why we're we're really looking at the the 70 centimeter band and uh, organized frequencies, which you'll you'll get to experience in your um, when you apply for the next season and so forth. I think we have a question also. What kind of antennas are on the trailer? Uh, what high gain? What kind? What kind of antennas are on the trailer? So the antennas on the trailer are primarily very large dipole antennas. So, you know, bigger the dipole, basically the higher the gain, obviously the, the length is, is, you know, proportional frequency and so forth. They're high quality dipole antennas um, that are elevated off the ground. The elevation off the ground is one of the biggest things, right? So, you know, that's, if, if you go, you know, look up any RF theory, the closer you are to the ground, the, the, the bigger the issue is. So the, the, the height is, is the biggest piece the gain being the next uh, biggest piece. And then within the trailer, we have an environment to house and to properly cool, you know, low, low noise amplifiers and things like that. So the hardware set in the trailer and the cable, even the cable going to the antenna is uh, is a totally different, different situation. You know, when you're, you know, comparing some little tiny, you know, cable that's running off an SMA connector to, um, you know, I, well, we don't use Heliacs, but we use some pretty high grade large cable to to keep our, our noise down and our sensitivity up. Was there another question or did that answer the question uh, completely? So, OK, super. Um, well, I have basically got to the end of my talk. I'm hoping for some more questions. I'm going to leave it open for a little bit uh, to uh, spur some more more questions and communications. Uh, how many people do we have in the in the chat right now? A lot. A lot. Wake up! Don't save all your questions to send to me in an email, even though I do respond to each one of you individually. It is painful, but yes, yes, I do so. Um, it, 
Uh... Okay, awesome. Polarization questions about RF, super. Uh, no, the linear polarization of the antenna is not a problem. Um, you're probably thinking, okay, my rocket is going straight up and I have a little dipole antenna inside, you know, the rocket, or maybe you're, you know, you've got a cylindrical patch array, which would be really cool. I'd love to see that. Um, the polarization mismatch is not an issue. It, it's really not. And then once your vehicle has left the pad, um, it's all over the place. So, you know, it's, it'll be pseudo straight for a while. Um, but once your shoot's out, the vehicle's tumbling all over the place. And again, where I'm really interested in packets, I'm not so interested about the up part. I want the down part. So after Apogee, I want to know, hopefully, you haven't broken into a bunch of pieces. I want to know where Apogee's at, and I want to know how fast you're falling. And I want to look at that, that rate, and I want to determine if you have shoots out, if you're coming in ballistic, and then try to determine where you're coming in and let those folks know what's going on. So no, the polarization is not an issue. Um, and that's basically the answer to the question there. Looks like we've got another question. Three, two of them are around frequencies. All right. Support, are we going to publish a list of our frequencies from the trailer? And so list of frequencies. Not so list, list of frequencies. Uh, the trailer for you guys uh, can handle 70 centimeter, uh, 900 megahertz for the for the featherweights, and on rare occasions, two meter. I want to encourage you guys to stay away from transmitting on two meter, or just stay away for your telemetry, because uh, we're blasting out some some pretty high power on uh, around the two meter area. So, and I don't want to say no, but the point is, is the 70 centimeter band is being kept quiet for you. Use it. Use that band. The 900 megahertz band is, um, it, the 900 megahertz band is kind of a free for all. Um, yes, we can receive 900 megahertz signals specifically for the featherweight. Um, but again, our primary band that we really want you guys to focus on for your telemetry is 70 centimeters. So, in fact, we we uh, we look for high power transmitters in the 70 centimeter range. So, if you come to the cup and you set up a high power 70 centimeter transmitter signal, it find you and we will tell you to turn it off. So, keep 70 centimeters nice and quiet. Your transmitters in don't need to be powerful. Do not go put a five watt transmitter in your rocket. You do not need that. Okay, milliwatts will get this done. So I hope that answered that question. I think there's a couple other questions in there. One more. Andy is so, asking us to talk more about the team recovery teams. Okay. So recovery teams. Well, let's let's go back to the recovery team slides. Go back and take a look at these slides here. So let's see. We got a – well, there's a, a picture of the uh, – we can start there, the, the picture of the packs and so forth. So, Okay. So the process of the teams, let's talk about what the teams go through. And the, the process evolves every year. We try to make it better and better. Um, I wish I could turn down the temperature. I haven't figured out how to do that one yet. Um, so it's always hot. Uh, we try to get bigger, bigger tents and more fans. So we try to help you with that. Um, but what happens is your recovery team, your set of people that are for recovering your rocket, come over to the recovery tent. Um, they sign in and so forth, and we check out your team and so forth. Now, one of the first requirements that you need to meet, closed-toed shoes and pants. Do not come to my recovery tent in shorts and flip-flops. Now, we've had that happen several times before, and there was one team. I don't know if you guys are, are still around, but i got to give them respect on this. He was wearing shorts, had closed-toed shoes. Uh, but he was wearing shorts. I said, "No way, you're not. You're not going out there without pants and close-toed shoes." Well, what am I going to do? I can't. I can't go into town to go buy some pants and so forth. He went back to camp and made himself some pants out of duct tape. I'm cool with that, <laughs> especially at an at an engineering competition. Might have been a little warm, but hey. Um, so again, proper attire. You're walking out into the desert, okay? 
uh, especially if you're not from an area that's that's hot like that and has some of the the nasty snakes and so forth. So proper attire, very important. So you, you come, get signed in. Um, we're also providing or starting to provide more and more information about landmarks, what's out there. You know, you heard me talk about the the pink parachute 200 feet north of me, why I'm out there and so forth. So those landmarks, we're gathering more and more of that. Oh, and there's actually another note there. Take a Sharpie. And I know this. people hate to do this because the rockets are so pretty after they finish them. Put your team number all over it. Your parachute, the, the fin can, the motor, the nose cone, everything. Put your team number on it. Because one of the issues we have is a recovery team will go up and see a debris field. Well, there's a white nose cone. Great. Who's that belong to? If it had a team number on it, they could report it. We could put that in recovery. When that team comes up, they'll say, oh, well, our nose cone's at this coordinates. And that starts to give you an idea of where your rocket and or debris field is, right? So again, we're still in the beginning of the recovery stage here, right? So eventually, as you work your way through through the recovery tent, uh, you're going to, the leader of your recovery team is going to get one of these packs. And as we talked about before, uh, there's voice communication and GPS communication with that pack. You're going to get a quick training on how to talk on the radio and so forth. That person talking on the radio um, has got to speak English and they have to speak clear English. Um, and if they know their phonetics, even better. So think about those requirements when you're picking your lead for a recovery. That really, really helps us. You help us, we can get you information. So make that easy, right? So you're, again, your transmitter on your rocket, make it easy. Make that packet easy for us to get. The voice on the, the recovery side, make, you know, pick that person that can communicate properly with us. We are trying to get you to your rocket. We want to get you out there, get your rocket, and get you back safely and quickly. That is literally our mission. Now, after you have the pack, you're going to be standing around for a little bit. And you're going to wait for deployment. Guy's going to come on the radio and say, hey, you're clear to deploy when we know it's safe for you to go a given direction. Again, back to those radiuses that you saw on our map. Are they green, are they yellow, are they red, so forth, right? So we'll make the call on whether it's safe to deploy. You guys go out, you get your rocket. The timer started at that point. So we're gonna want you to check in every increment. That increment varies a little bit. We'll let you know what that is. If you don't check in, if you do not check in and you decide to run off on your own and you come back two hours later, and say, hey, here's my pack. I got my rocket. That's fabulous. You're disqualified. And I'm serious about this. So you have to stay in contact with recovery. So that person better know how to communicate. And I don't care if you got to pull over and stand on your car. You get on that radio and you talk to us. Now, think about what could happen otherwise, right? Team's gone for two hours or something like that heat stroke, things like that is very, very important, which is why we're kind of kind of tough on the disqualification portion. Keep the team you need to keep the team together, too. Now, I know you're going to spread out a little bit. Stay in in a walking, easy walking distance and a line of sight. Now, a line of sight can get way out there. So don't you know, don't don't push us on that. All right. Because we only have tracking on that one person. So safety is critical. We will get you to your rocket. We, again, that's part of why we, we added the GPS requirement. So get us the packets so we can see where your rocket's at. We'll get you to that, get you back, and uh, get you to finish the competition because that's that's the goal is to do this and have fun and, and do it safely. So, and that's uh, I think we have one more question coming in. All right, questions. APRS question about the time APRS between uh, packets. How quickly should you send APRS packets? So um, we like them pretty quick, actually. Uh, I, I would be okay with with one second. In fact, the the, the quicker they are, um, the easier it is for us to determine, um, you know, if your shoots have come out and so forth. We got to wait five seconds. Rockets already halfway back down, you know, or down if you're in ballistic, right? So uh, quick is good, and because you're being you're parked on a frequency, you're not hammering on top of anybody else. So, so that's okay. And that, and by the way, that that time 
And if you're looking at time slices, uh, which you can select, uh, you know, which which time period to put the packet in and so forth uh, to to coordinate uh, multiple uh, transmitters on a single frequency in a single vehicle, like you're doing multi-stage and things like that. Um, we will clarify all of that with you during frequency registration. So uh, fast is good, but we'll talk about that during your frequency registration. So we have another question. One, uh, don't test, don't leave your packets on while in the. So, so transmitting camp. while you're in camp. Um, yeah, don't don't just let it sit there and blare. Uh, it is advantageous if you're parked on on your own frequency and you know you want to do some testing and so forth but if we start to run out of frequency allocations and we have to overlap um, basically you need to be cur courteous right so don't just let it sit there and blast away um, you know and this happens a lot where somebody says okay i'm going to take a transmitter and i'm going to duct tape a lithium polymer battery to it and wrap it in foam and throw it in the nose cone and let it sit there for three days don't don't do that okay so be, be courteous to your other rf folks around you so and we have another question coming in. How to get feedback to the telemetry, discussion between MCC and the teams on telemetry. Okay. Uh, so the discussion between the teams and MCC about telemetry. Now, there's a piece of that that we're still working on, um, and how that will work is when you are in the pits. For instance, say you're in camp and you want to test your GPS to make sure that when you get out to the rail, you're ready to go. Um, this is an additional effort for us that we're working on, on figuring out because you guys don't have one of our radios to talk to us. So this is a, a, a situation with ESRA that, that we're working with them on, and we'll come up with some, some sort of solution there. It, it might involve, uh, you know, uh, the, when, the, the time period when you're close to registration, so when you're, you know, maybe just before or, just, or something like that, I don't have an exact answer for that yet, but that is something we want to do. As far as when you're on the rail or headed out to the rail, um, we expect you to have your, your GPS, GPS on because uh, basically we're not going to release your rocket until we have a solid lock. So obviously if you're, if you're preparing to launch, powered up and let it go you know you have priority at that point if you're on the rail you have frequency priority i hope that answered it looks like we got another question there yeah a question decoding oh okay so on the the altus metrum stuff uh we don't need to decode their proprietary packet you just need to check the checkbox that says transmit APRS, and that's it. So, and for the folks that didn't realize that, now you know. So go into the setup. There's literally a box that says check APRS, um, and then you want to transmit the uh, the 1200 baud um, uh, uncompressed APRS, which I think is is default for that. The other packet, uh, the proprietary packet, you can you can transmit as, as fast as you want. I, I I personally fly those and I usually leave them set as fast as possible. So a question follow up that. Another question. The transmit rates the once every two seconds if a team wanna transmit more often five times per second, is it okay within the I rec rules? I you know, I don't remember. I believe that is true. Uh, I don't have the rules in front of me. I would need to reference back to those. Um, but you do need to follow whatever the current written rules are. That's what we need to follow. And and that all comes into great clarity when you're doing your your uh, frequency registration. We talk about the the time periods and what you're using and so forth. A question on recovery teams. Can they take their own radios with them? So another question for recovery teams. Can we take our own radios with you? Absolutely. I encourage teams to have their own radios. Now, do not bring a set of radios and start transmitting on 70 centimeter because you're going to be walking all over people trying to do um, trying to do telemetry. Um, if you have radios, you know, the little Walmart specials or whatever, little FRS guys or something like that, those are on a different band. That's great. But if you go out as a recovery team, we can only talk to the lead and we can only track the lead. So that's our connection to you. That's the long range connection, right? 
if you have a team within your team and you all have radios, that is great. That's going to give you the, the capability to cover good ground. Now, that does not mean that you can let folks go out of sight or go out of easy walking distance from you. That does not mean you spread out into a huge search party. OK, you use it as a good tool, but you've got to stay safe. OK, if we have to come find you, we need to be able to find our our GPS transmitter that's attached to your lead and be able to easily find everybody in your team. So just keep that in mind. You cannot use your gear to talk to us. It's on a professional frequency and you're not allowed to use our frequency. OK, uh, I think we are out of questions and I think we might. Are we out of time? Are we out of? Let's see. We got 10 minutes left. OK. All right. I thought we had to stop at 45 after. But unless there's no more questions, um, that is is basically it. So uh, a quick summary. Uh, we got a trailer full of radios and antennas and we come out and and we basically help everyone talk to each other. And again, um, don't don't uh, don't worry about that ham ham license test. It it is it's super easy. Look over it real quick. Go take it. You'll be happy you took it. Um, I mean, I've, I've I've seen teams where you know one person takes it and says, oh geez, you know, just the whole team, just go take it and be done with it. You know, because it also puts you in a different situation to where you can use a, a better handheld within your team instead of using this little Walmart special you know, FRS radios and so forth. So anyhow, um, I wish all of you the best of luck. Um, and I think we have one more question coming in. Let's see. Just to verify with you. OK, so the question was, would I recommend if you do have ham license, so say the whole team has has their technician's license or whatever, ham license, and you all go get little little radios um, yes, I would prefer you use the two meter. You would prefer you use the two meter, basically. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that way you're not not stepping on 70 centimeter um, telemetry. So again, let's let's use the 70 centimeter band as our quiet telemetry place, um, and then two meter. Um, th there might be a team or two that uses some two meter stuff for telemetry, but it's going to be very rare. I don't recommend it because the antennas are big. The hardware is heavier and takes more power. So, so yes, that that would be great if you all had ham licenses and um, you use the two meter band for your your intercommunications with your team. That would be great. And we'll give a few seconds for any more questions. I think we're we're clear on the questions at this point. One more. Oh, another what one. What kind of antennas for out of ground? Ground station. So. OK, so I'm assuming you're talking about your own ground station telemetry or maybe you're even talking about a control station if you're doing a you know, big fancy hybrid or something like that. Um, I would recommend a, a decent dipole um, on a small mast of some kind. Um, I would not recommend a large mast um, that, that gets into issues with putting it up, keeping it up, um, it falling on people and so forth. Uh, um, again, the real issue with with antennas is you got to get away from the ground. You need to go up. So even if you're on a tripod or something like that, a decent dipole uh, will work for you. Um, the whole thing with the the yogis and all that and pointing it directly at the rocket. Again, you know that's 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 great for high altitude line of sight. You know you got to keep the antenna basically pointed at it. And you do have some polarization issues to deal with. Um, but uh, frankly, none of these rockets are really going high enough to, to necessitate it. Um, I easily track uh, rockets to 40, 50,000 feet with my dipole. Um, over that, we switch to some different types of antennas. Um, but again, in this competition, a good dipole is going to do you well basically every time. Um, second to that, you can get the best antenna on the planet. But if you get bad cables and bad connectors, it'll it'll destroy the whole thing. So so don't skimp when you're buying those cables and connectors and keep your hardware cool. If it over overheats, there's there's issues there, too. Any more questions? Looks like we got another one. I apologize if you answered this. 
and I'm for the reason APRS over Laura. APS over Laura. No, it's it's the deconvolution of the the Laura uh, on our side that we can't support right now. So again, Laura's cool, but um, yeah, just forming an APRS packet and and spinning it out over Laura is not going to qualify uh, for MCC reception at this point. Maybe in the future, a lot of people like Laura, so we'll we'll see where it goes. Okay, I think we've got a got a clear board. Still got 10 minutes left, but uh, we are basically done. So All right. thank you, Chris, everybody, thank you, for sir. the time. All righty. Uh, Andy, do you need anything else from us? No, sir. I think you covered everything very well. I appreciate it. Uh, all your time and uh, the Da Vinci team, as always, is, is uh, you know, one of the major, major supporters and uh, couldn't do the cup without you guys, for sure. So uh, very excited to have you guys out there again next year and uh, looking forward to having GPS tracking running very smoothly and uh, see a lot of teams moving in and out of the range uh, as needed. There's going to be uh, upwards of 130 to 150 teams competing uh, and uh, the flow, the inputs and outputs of teams in and out of the range has got to be very, very smooth. Uh, one last requirement I think I wanted to talk to everyone about is now that we are flying under Tripoli Rocketry Association rules, your recovery team members, and I think we usually keep that to about five, four, five, or six, I think. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. the team is the team's limited to to five. There's some caveats with right with rocket size and weights and so forth. But yes. So those members are going to be going out on an active Tripoli launch range. And so we are being required to make sure that those members of that um, members of that recovery team are they, they don't have to be high power certified. They can be level zero, uh, but they have to be members of Tripoli Rocketry Association. And luckily for everyone, the student membership fees are ten dollars a year. So it's not a significant investment. It does provide three million dollars of liability insurance. Uh, and that, that's going to include hybrid and liquid team. Uh, if you're going out on the range to recover your rocket, you're still going to have to show your triple identification card. Again, and, and to finalize, you do not have to be level one, level two, level three certified to be on the range recovery team. You just have to be a triple E rocket certification member. Uh, and it's okay, and it's, it sounds like the... Up. Sounds like the card is a hard hard requirement there. That that would greatly help us too, uh, yeah. to to verify who's on the, the recovery team. Okay, super. Appreciate it again. Thank you guys. And uh, we'll thank you everyone. Time. I look forward to I look forward to seeing everybody um, ready to get back out there and in the heat and see the tarantulas and rockets. <laughs> All right, everyone. All right. Thank you so much. Take care.